You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, recorded 6 p.m. on February 18, 2024, presented by Rev. Chris Duke. I read on Facebook this week, uh, someone pleading. Now, this you won't all, all agree with it, but someone pleading, please bring back the old hymns in church. <laughs> anyway. A lot of these hymns were written out of revival and reformation, a change of the heart. All right. We're going to begin a study in the evenings now in James. And um, James is, um, interesting enough, James was one book that Martin Luther, the uh, Early reformer just couldn't understand. So there you go. He wrote all. He wrote a whole commentary on Romans. It was through his commentary on Romans that when John Wesley was uh, reading it, he was just reading the preface. He wasn't even getting into the commentary. And uh, the uh, description is described: his heart was strangely warmed. So hadn't even got into the meat, and the Lord warmed his heart so um, I, I, I guess I just feel for uh, uh, Martin Luther that he never quite got got uh, got James but then um, you know those early scholars they had to rely on on the books and memory and uh, they didn't have all of the cross references that we have today they didn't have uh, computers that uh, computer programs that can find this verse and this idea and uh, I don't know how they did it but uh, and they memorize scripture off by heart which is a great feat so tonight we're going to deal with James chapter 1 but I'm going to read the first three verses so that um, it makes sense James a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your, of your faith produces patience. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider this introduction to the book of James, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would enable us to see something here that we may not have seen before. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's been some, uh, there's been some debate as to the identity of the book of James, who actually is the author of the book of James. Of course, which James is it? Now, one prominent James in the Gospels is James, the brother of John. Now, these uh, James and John, they were called the sons of thunder, which implies that they were good at battling and fighting amongst themselves and also fighting other people. So that was the James and the John that we, we uh, see in the Gospels. But in Acts 12, this James was martyred. He was killed by the sword approximately 11 years following the crucifixion of Jesus under the instruction of uh, the king of the time, which was Herod. Now, that's not the same Herod. That was the Herod when Jesus was born, but he, he was a, a, a relative. And then there's a James who was the person who's uh, chaired the first church council. Okay, I call it the first church council. We could call it the first uh, assembly of Jerusalem, recorded in Acts 15. Of course, this was a meeting of the apostles and the leaders of the church at that time. This James was the brother of Jesus, and the book of James is attributed to him. I believe that he's the right James. There are a, a, a variety of reasons for believing this, there was nobody else in the early church who was significant to sign his name 
to a book, James, and have everybody instantaneously knowing who this James was, other than James, the brother of the Lord. Now in John chapter 7 verse 5, this James, this brother of Jesus, was not yet a believer especially concerning the claims of Jesus and as to his person and his work. For it says there, even his brothers did not believe in him. They thought uh, he was crazy. Now this expression indicates here that during Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus' brother and even Mary, there's a passage there that talks about even Mary was, was with uh, the siblings And they didn't quite understand what Jesus was doing. They thought he was mad. Come on, son, you better come home. That's when he was in Capernaum. You see, they didn't have saving faith at that time. They didn't have belief in the person of Jesus. They just saw him as their sibling and son. But somewhere, sometime, God changed James' heart. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us when and where. However, after the crucifixion, as as the disciples are meeting together in the upper room praying, James and his brothers are found there kneeling with them in prayer, asking for God, asking God for help and grace. They soon after, following the day of Pentecost, we find that James emerges not only as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ but also as one of the key leaders in the life of the early Christian church. In fact, it would be James perhaps more than any other single person, any other single individual who helped keep the church, the early church, together in Jerusalem in the days where there was so much controversy being hurled against the Apostle Paul for his teaching about the Gentiles and their role in this young Jewish Christianity. It was James who welcomed Paul to Jerusalem. It was James who pronounced at the first council, the first church council in Acts 15, that Paul was correct in taking the gospel to the Gentiles and not requiring Gentiles to keep the ceremonial law. Even though we know that James was one who particularly was still very much into Old Testament practices and he kept the ceremonial ordinances. Therefore, James was a man of tremendous stature in the days of the early church. Now, the second thing to note about the content of James is that this letter is predominantly um, uh, 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 about ethics. You see, it's about Christian living. It's practical in how Christians ought to live. For in its directness, it is direct at times, it also may step on people's toes. You see, there's parts of James that we'll find uncomfortable. And friends, we often need some direct, plain speech to challenge us where we might feel comfortable and uh, it might make us, make us uncomfortable with our sins. It may convict us of our sin and to spur us to righteous living. That's the aim of this book. The book of James exhorts us to live Christianly as individuals but also in our community of faith, in the family of God. Now, some people talk about holiness but live hypocritically. Some people make a profession of perfect love, yet they cannot live at peace with their brothers. The person who is an antimonian, antinomian, now this is a big word, so I'll explain what it means. An antinomian is a person who rejects the law and argues against moral and religious views, and this person supports free grace. Okay? Because of grace, you can do as you like. But this person doesn't recognise the need for living purely. And that person 
If you're one of those persons, you need to meditate on James' practical wisdom. All who are long on religious theory but short on practical Christianity or to immerse themselves into the book of James. There will always be such people in every age. So the message of James will always be relevant. In one sentence, James teaches four things. Okay, the very first verse shows us the proper humility that Christians ought to have. He shows us the glory of the Saviour. He shows us the unity of the plan of God and the unity of the church. And he shows us the life situation that every Christian ought to expect. So let's read again James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. In James' opening phrase, we learn a, about, a lot about the humility of, Jesus, of uh, James. Look at what he calls himself. What does he call himself? A bondservant of God. James' opening words of describing himself as an example to all Christians. This James, who is a half-brother of Jesus, who grew up in the same home of Jesus, who may have even lied in the same bed of Jesus as a child, who was one of Jesus' closest relatives, calls himself Jesus' servant, a bond servant. Now, he could have big noted himself here. He could have called himself, I'm the bishop of the Church of Jerusalem. He could have used a, a title, a pillar of the church, which is the way Paul describes James. Paul calls him a pillar of the church. He could have said from James, the leader of the first church council. And all of this would have been true. But James introduces himself as James, a bondservant. James, a willing slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a bondservant is a permanent servant. James is a permanent slave of Christ. And this shows us this man's humility. The great man of God is not one who thinks of himself as great, but rather that he is utterly insignificant. Utterly insignificant. This is how James thought about himself. Friends, this isn't just a testimony to James' personal and individual humility. It's how every Christian should think of themselves. Friends, is this how you think of yourself? James' introduction is to call to Christian servanthood and humility. Do you see yourself as a servant of Jesus Christ? Are you living out your profession of faith as a servant of Jesus Christ? Or are you a child of this world, seeking out carnal desires, earthly and worldly satisfaction, not walking in the way of the Lord? Are you really living like a servant of Jesus? What are your priorities of your life? Do you desire to know Jesus? Do you desire to love him and to obey him? in every area of life? Does your speech demonstrate that you're a servant of Jesus? We know that James's life demonstrated that he was indeed a servant of Jesus. And so this designation of James is a challenge to us to be real servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. So James' humility shows us something about proper Christian humility. This opening phrase not only shows us something about James, it also shows us something about Jesus. It's a testimony to the lordship and to the divinity of Jesus Christ. James in his description here puts Jesus on par with God. This is a testimony to the divinity of Jesus Christ and to the trinity 
of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That there is one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of them equal in power and glory, and yet one God. Right here is evidence of the Trinity and of the deity or the divinity of Christ. And here James willingly identifies himself as a servant of his older brother. Now, would you publicly identify yourself as a servant of your older brother? If you have an older brother, I don't have an older brother. I had two older sisters. Now, sometimes you might think of your older brothers Sometimes you might think your older brothers treat you as a servant. <laughs> I think my younger brother might have thought that way at times. But can you imagine willingly and happily calling yourself a servant of your older brother? That's what James does here. And James testifies to the deity of Christ. James, who grew up with him as a little boy, but now believes and testifies that Jesus is indeed divine, that he is God. And this is a wonderful testimony to the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. When once J James doubted his brother and he thought he was crazy, when he went off teaching and preaching during his earthly ministry, but now he says, I'm the servant of God and saviour Jesus the Christ. That's what he now says. In James' self-introduction, he gives us an exalted view of Jesus Christ. And so this begs the question, do you have an exalted view of Jesus Christ? Do you love him? Do you want to know him more and more about him? Do you want to grow in his love? Do you want to grow in his knowledge? Do you want to be conformed to his image? Do you have a high view of Christ? Now, I realise that many people don't believe in the deity of Christ. However, most of us say that we do. But believing in a high view of Christ, the question is, does, this, does your life show that you have a high view of Christ? Are the Lord's priorities your priorities? Do you love his commandments? Do you love the things that he wants you to do? Are you longing to do them? So in his introduction, James has a high view of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus. The third thing to see in James's introduction is the unity of God's church. James addresses the church in Old Testament terms. He calls them to the 12 tribes. Now we learn something here, not only from whom this letter is from, that is from whom this letter is written, but to whom this letter is written, to the 12 tribes. Now theological scholars will debate uh, here, but it's very clear that the 12 tribes mentioned here are not of uh, Jews or even of Jewish Christians only, but they are of Christians. More specifically, it's about the Christian church. James uses Old Testament language and applies it to the New Testament church. It's an Old Testament title for Israel that originates way back to the days of the fathers of Israel, even to the time spent in the wilderness. And James applies it now to Christians, to believers in Christ. This application of Old Testament language to the church shows that the church is actually the continuation or the fulfilment of Israel. It's not disconnected from the old covenant Israel. It is the fulfilment of God's plan with his people of old. And this realisation should impact us in two ways. Firstly, it should impact us so that we appreciate our part in God's plan of salvation. The New Testament Christian values the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, 
The New Testament Christian doesn't say that the Old Testament is old and has no value now. Nor, do, nor the New Testament is, because it's new, it's so, it has more value. We don't say that. When Paul said that all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable, he was speaking mostly of the Old Testament. There wasn't a canon of the New Testament when Paul said that. A New Testament apostle saying that the Old Testament is inspired and it's profitable. And James is addressing Christians as the 12 tribes reminds us that the Old Testament, that is that history, that time is also ours. That time is also yours. That's your story. That's my story as well. Those people are your great relatives. That story is your story. Your family is recorded between Genesis and Malachi. That's your family genealogy. The Old Testament is your book if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. When James calls us the 12 tribes, he reminds us that God's plan doesn't have two peoples. It doesn't have two plans and it doesn't have two ways of salvation because there's only one people, one way of salvation, one plan. God's plan began when he called out a people to himself under the old covenant. And those old covenant people are intertwined into one people with all the people who have ever been saved since the days of Christ. As one reads Ephesians 2, it's Jew and Gentile who are brought into God's family. There is one bind and we belong to one another. God doesn't have any alternative plan. He has one plan and we're part of that plan. Israel, the church. The church is part, is part of the one people of God in all ages. And so even the terms that, Jesus, that James, is, James uses in verse 1 to address the church reminds the church of its heritage, of the glory of the Old Testament. Therefore, teaching it, it's useful and it's profitable for instruction and they'll be part of it in God's plan and the one people of God in all ages. Now, James' words of introduction in verse 1 convey our situation of our present life in this fallen world. The author indicates to us in the terms that he uses the life situation of the church. We are God's chosen and covenant people, but we live dispersed as pilgrims all over the world from every tribe and nation and language group in this fallen world. James also uses Old Testament language for Israel in the wilderness. What does he call them? To the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. What does that make you think of? For one, it makes you think of the wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness the pressures and the testings of the wilderness when Israel was wandering without a land that belonged to her. This language for Israel the pilgrim, Israel the wanderer, Israel the dispersed sets the tone for the context of the book of James. What's the next thing that James talks about from verse 2 to the end of the chapter? He talks about trials. Trials. Trials that James expects Christians to face are those of the wandering tribes of Israel. James uses this language of the 12 tribes to draw attention to the pressures and the persecutions of this life. Think of Israel in the desert. And as they're dispersed throughout a menacing and a testing world, their ha homeland is actually elsewhere. And they haven't yet reached home. 
Presently they feel the pressures of life, the lure of this world's temptations and a pressure to conform to the standards of their pagan environment. They are the Lord's people, yes, but they haven't yet reached home. Friends, if Christ is your Lord and Saviour, you are part of the Lord's 12 tribes. You are dispersed throughout a menacing and a testing world. Your home is elsewhere. Your present lot is to feel the weight of life's pressures, the lure of the world's temptations and an insidious, ever-present encouragement to conform to the standards of this pagan world we live in. You are the Lord's people, but you're not yet home. And James reminds us that in this fallen world, we should expect trials, we should expect challenges, we should even expect obstacles, we should expect pressures, we should expect evil. Life often brings unexpected disappointments and unmet expectations. It brings shattered dreams or failed plans. Friends, disappointments can be faced in relationships. They can be faced in careers or or personal aspirations. Disappointment is one of the most common examples of trials in the Christian life. Just think of Joseph. He experienced betrayal and then he experienced imprisonment and slavery. Yet he he emerged as a mighty leader In Egypt, we know the story. In moments of disappointment, we can find solace from Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, which encourages us to trust in the Lord's plan and lean not on our own understanding. And loneliness is a profound human experience that can leave us feeling isolated and abandoned. Even Jesus experienced loneliness. He experienced deep loneliness especially when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested. And when he was there, his disciples fell asleep and that made his loneliness ever so greater. Yet Jesus turned to his heavenly Father and he found solace and strength in communion with him. Similarly, we can draw near to God, knowing that his promises to be always that he promises to always be with us, even in our loneliest moments. Doubts and questions are natural aspects of our faith journey. You know, friends, we may wrestle with theological uncertainties. We may wrestle with doubts about God's goodness even or of his presence in our lives. Remember that Thomas at first doubted that Jesus rose from the dead. It wasn't until he saw the risen Christ and when he was invited to place his hand in Jesus' side and into his, in, into his hands and feel the nail prints. Friends, when doubts arise, we can bring them before God, seeking his truth and resting in his assurance, knowing that he understands our human struggles. You know, fear can paralyse us. Fear can hinder our progress in our Christian walk. We may fear failure, we may fear rejection, or we may fear the unknown. Most of us don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't. But I know that my Lord liveth. You know, the Israelites, they faced crippling fear, didn't they, when they stood at the Red Sea And behind them was the Egyptian army closing in behind them. However, we know that God intervened. He parted the waters and he led them to safety. He reminded them and he reminds us now that he is with us. He is with us. And that we need not fear. We need not fear. You know, fear is one of those examples of trials in the Christian life, which can be overcome by faith and it can be overcome by faith alone, only by faith alone. By embracing faith over fear, 
we can experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. And these examples of trials, and these are not the only trials, of course, remind us that we live in a fallen world. But friends, our God is good. He doesn't always let us in on his purposes, on his counsels, on his will. I have no idea what some of God's purposes are. But I do know this, and I'm sure that you know it as well. When you're united with the Saviour, you're not only in the glory to come, but friends, you're also in the sufferings of this present time, in this present age, whatever they might be. And we all have different trials. We all have different sufferings. And at times when we might experience a form of suffering, God has a purpose. And so, friends, we're reminded to trust in him. Let us trust in him. James reminds us that we are pilgrims dispersed in a fallen world. And even in this word of greeting, he calls us to this pilgrimage to trust in our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. He is the bondservant of God. James is the bondservant of God. Are you the bondservant of God? If you are, may you humble yourself before God. James recognises that Jesus is divine and gives him glory, even though humanly he is his half-brother. Do you recognise the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ? He is very man, but very God. James affirms Jesus' divinity, although a relative here calls him Lord. And as we face the trials of life, we face them knowing that Jesus is surely with us. Whatever trial, whatever is before us, Jesus is with us. Friends, right now, may we all turn to Jesus. Not just in times of trial, but in times of joy as well. When things are going well, may we rejoice in them. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this greeting of James, a bondservant of God. And we thank you for his humility we pray, Lord, that each one of us will also in our lives have this same humility. But, Lord, we also pray that you will help us to trust you ever so more, to believe in you ever so more, to love you ever so more as we go out into the world doing your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church dot org dot au or wherever you get your podcasts from